There's a phenomenon when people get lost in the wilderness that they hide from their rescuers. It doesn't always happen, but sometimes people hide from the people who are searching for them because they believe that they might have to pay for the government for the rescue effort. Uh, for the time the rescuer spent looking uh, for equipment, for fuel, whatever. It's more common that people who are lost will go into a mode of avoidance, uh, maybe as a form of stress disorder. It seems strange or counterintuitive, but it seems that because they are already frightened, when they hear the shouts of people who are looking for them or, or see search vehicles, these lost people become more frightened and try to hide from them. I've done it myself. Once when I was out in the woods hunting with my dad, I took a brief walk to get warmed up. I planned to go one direction until I hit the edge of a swamp that was on the map. Then I followed the edge of the swamp for a bit until I was warm enough and turned back toward the path uh, I know that I'd followed to get to where I had started. When I had been walking for a bit, I realized I somehow missed the path. After wandering around for a bit, I realized I was turned around. I mean, that's what you say when you have a map and a compass and you know how to use them. Uh, so I headed toward a, a pond that I saw on the map. Eventually, I realized that I had either missed the pond or it had somehow disappeared. I mean, not magically, but it dried up somehow. That's when I panicked. I started yelling for my dad and wandering erratically through the woods. And when I saw uh, some blaze orange clothing in the distance, I thought it was my dad and I, and I headed toward it. When I saw that it wasn't him, I changed my face. I changed my pace. I just sort of wandered past the guy. I gave him a bit of a wave and stayed lost for a while until I finally found someone else and asked for directions. It was weird, even for me. It was weird because, well, first, I had hunted that area before. And second, I had a map and a compass and I knew how to use them. And third, I had a backup plan to head toward a specific compass bearing and it would lead to the highway and I could walk it back to the parking area. It was weird because I knew what to do. I had the ability to do it, and at some point, I just chose not to do it. Even though I knew a second way out, I chose not to follow it because it would mean I'd be done hunting for the day, because it would take me the rest of the day to, to get out to the highway and then walk it back to my dad's truck. Now, it's one thing to get turned around or just plain lost. It's another thing altogether to stay lost when you know the way out but just don't want to follow it. Either way, you're still lost. The best way to avoid getting lost is to have good information, like a map, good guidance, like a compass, good instruction, like how to use a map and a compass together to navigate real terrain, and good support, like my dad, or someone else who knows what they're doing. Basically, this is what Paul told the church in Corinth when they got turned around, maybe even lost from the truth of the gospel. When Paul heard that things weren't quite right among them, with division, bad theology, bad practice, he wrote uh, in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, Paul reminded them that they had received good information, good guidance, uh, instruction in it, good support. He had preached the gospel, and they believed it, and they had taken a stand on it. Paul started with certainty that what they had received and believed and stood upon had saved them. But he reminded them that they had to hold on to what they had received and believed. Otherwise, he said in verse 2, they believed in vain. 
In other words, they were saved because they responded to the gospel in repentant faith, but if they gave up the gospel, they would be lost. Now, with this reminder, Paul tells the early church, he tells us, don't get lost. Now, this isn't a simple warning that things might go wrong if we don't pay attention. It's not a warning that this way is better than others, so we probably ought to choose this way over others. No, Paul said in verse 3 that this is of first importance. This is a dire warning that if we wander away from the gospel, we're wandering away from God. That if we don't stand on the gospel, we're not standing on anything. That if we don't hold on to the gospel, the word of God that, that was preached and taught to us, we've wasted our time, maybe even our lives. And that's scary. Now, I think the scariest part of this reminder from Paul is the statement he makes in verse 2 regarding salvation and the gospel, that we are saved by the gospel if we hold firmly to the word. That if we don't hold firmly to the word that has been preached, that, that we've believed in vain. Now, I don't think this is scary simply because we might somehow lose our salvation but because it's possible to let go of our salvation if we let go of the gospel. This is scary because many Christians, even many churches, get lost from the mission of the church, making disciples of Jesus who make disciples of Jesus, and become content to head in whatever direction we're going and doing the things that we're doing instead of making disciples. It's scary because... There's a lot of stuff that we can do, some better than others, some more important than others, and we let those things distract us. It's scary how quickly and easily we become content doing those other things. It's scary because when we're reminded that we've gotten lost from the gospel, as Paul reminded the church in Corinth, we get offended and we dig in our heels and we resist the mission and the work of the gospel or we get frightened or overwhelmed, and we shrink back from doing what we know we ought to do. It's scary because we get lost, and then we stay lost. The thing is, it's easy for any of us to do it. I mean, even a preacher. It's easy to get busy doing things in the church building, doing things in the name of the church or in the name of Jesus himself, but not actually keeping our mission just wandering around lost, looking like we know what we're doing, sounding like we know what we're doing, but not stopping long enough to consider whether we really know what we're doing, to look around and figure out that we are, in fact, lost. Not necessarily lost from God, but lost from what God has done from us through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and our mission to share that good news with other people. This reminder from Paul shouldn't be scary. It shouldn't be intimidating. It shouldn't cause us to become indignant because we're heading in the wrong direction or not heading in any direction at all. I mean, it's good news, right? So if it makes us uncomfortable, if it makes us bristle a bit, if it makes us reconsider who we are and what we're doing and how we're doing it, that's good news too. Because we need to start here with the gospel so we don't get lost. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, to hold firmly to the word. Otherwise, we've believed in vain. But maybe we also need a reminder that at one time we were lost. Not just wandering, but completely separated from God because of our sin. Jesus told the crowds in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why Jesus also taught the crowds in Luke 15, uh, the parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and why he told them about God's desire to save the lost. In Luke 15, verse 10, he said, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. That's why Jesus preached the gospel with urgency. Uh, in Mark 
chapter 1, verse 15. He said, the time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The gospel is the good news of God's salvation for lost sinners through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for all who accept Jesus as Lord in faithful repentance. The gospel is good news for lost sinners, and it's good news for saved sinners who need to be reminded, don't get lost. Paul gave the church another reminder, writing in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, if you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Now, basically, Paul reminded the church, he reminds us, you were lost, but you were saved through the gospel. So don't get lost. Now, how do we do that? Well, Paul tells us, stand on the gospel so you don't get lost. There in verse 23, we find a statement similar to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. Uh, Here he writes in Colossians 1, verse 23, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Again, the good news of the gospel to to the church is you were lost, but now you're saved. So stand on the gospel so you don't get lost. Now, honestly, I think this is good news, not just because it's about salvation, but because it's so simple. The mission and the message of the church, the gospel, the good news of salvation through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and our faith in him, this is what we've heard, what we believed, what we've accepted, and what we preach and teach and hold on to so that not only are we saved, but also those who hear our message and believe it, and accept it, and respond to it, just like we have. It's simple, but we've made it complicated. We hear the good news of salvation through Jesus, we believe it, we repent, we confess Jesus as Lord, we're baptized into Christ, and then we end up somehow working on programs, events, projects, buildings, all in the name of Jesus, but not making disciples of Jesus. When we lose the gospel, we get lost. However, Paul reminds us to stand on the gospel so we don't get lost. Now, first, Paul reminds us that we need to be reconciled to God through Christ. He writes in Colossians 1, verses 21 and 22, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Paul reminds us of where we started as sinners. And this is true for all of us. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, no one is good except God alone. And Paul explained this, writing in Romans 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Because we're all sinners. As Paul tells us here in Colossians 1, 21, we were alienated from God. We were enemies in our minds. We were lost. Now that's the bad news, but there's good news. And this is where the gospel starts. With our reconciliation with God through the death of burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and our faith in him. We were alienated. We were enemies. We were lost. But because of Jesus and through our repentant faith in him, we are reconciled to God. Now, Paul also says here in verse 22, we are holy in his sight, without blemish, free from accusation. 
Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 2, By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. So be reconciled to God. Stand on the gospel so you don't get lost. Then Paul reminds us that we need to be established. That is, don't just be reconciled to God, but stay reconciled to God. Once we've taken a stand on the gospel for our salvation, to keep standing on the gospel. Again, Paul wrote in Colossians 1 verse 23, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. Now let's be clear, this isn't a matter of losing your salvation. Jesus promised that once we've been saved, nobody can take our salvation from us. He said in John 10 verses 28 and 29, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. We can't just simply lose our salvation. We can't have it taken away from us. But we can turn away from it, walk away from it, even run away from God and our salvation. Hebrews 3 verses 12 through 14 warns, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. This is the same warning that Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. It's the same that he wrote here in Colossians 1, verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. That's important. Do not move from the gospel. Church, we have to make sure that we stand on the gospel so we don't get lost. It's not enough to spend time in the building, filling our heads with sermons and lessons and Bible studies, if we're going to let go of preaching the gospel and making disciples. It's not enough to, to do good things for people, if we're going to let them uh, go away with food and clothes, but without hearing the good news of salvation through Jesus. Remember, I, I had a map and a compass and, and training to use them, but I didn't do what I knew I should do, and I stayed lost. Church, we need to stand on the gospel so we don't get lost. Ultimately, church, Paul is reminding us, if you're going to stand on the gospel so you don't get lost, you need to be a servant. That's what we find in Paul. When Paul writes, uh, Colossians 1, verse 23, This is the gospel that you heard and that was proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. By the gospel, we are reconciled to God. We're saved. And that's good news. But there's more to the gospel than getting a ticket to heaven. We need to be established in the gospel holding on to the truth of the gospel so that we might live it and share it. When we hear the gospel and believe it and respond to it in faithful repentance, we're saved both from our sins and for our purpose, to serve the gospel so that others might be saved. We're not dunked and done. We're saved to serve. Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 verse 10, We are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So yes, church, we need to do good works because of God's work in us by the gospel, by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and our faith in Him. However, we do the good works as servants of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds, and glorify your Father in heaven. 
as we do good deeds, it must be as servants of the gospel, for the sake of the gospel, proclaiming the gospel. Otherwise, we hide the gospel. And Jesus himself, Paul warned the early church in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. If all we're doing is good deeds, simply because they're good, or even because Jesus told us to do good deeds, without the good news of the gospel, the world won't see Jesus, and the world will remain lost. And so we need to be servants of the gospel. We need to stand on the gospel so we don't get lost. Paul was a servant of the gospel, and he gave the church an example of how to follow the gospel without getting lost. <clears throat> Listen to how Paul described his life and work as a servant of the gospel. Uh, he wrote in Colossians 1 verses 24 through 29, Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. I have become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. There's a lot to being a servant of the gospel. There's even suffering, Paul says in verse 24. But as a servant of the gospel, he says he rejoices that he can fill up in his flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions. Now there he's talking about Jesus' suffering and his death which, remember, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, that, that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. Paul rejoiced that he could suffer like Jesus so that he might serve the gospel, the good news of forgiveness of sins and new life through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. This is why Paul had taken his stand on the gospel, not just for the sake of his own salvation, but for the sake of our salvation, so that we might know, as it says in Colossians 1 verse 27, the, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. A church, we must also stand on the gospel so that we don't get lost, so that others won't remain lost. We must start here with the gospel. Get back to the gospel, preaching, teaching, and living the good news of Jesus. As Paul reminds us in Colossians 1, verses 28 and 29, He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, uh, so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. And to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. Now to this end, church, we must all strenuously contend with all the energy that Christ so powerfully works in each of us and, and among all of us together. So to that end, I offer this invitation to those who have not yet put their faith in Jesus. The bad news is that all of us have been alienated from God, become enemies of God because of our sin. But the good news is that God loves us and wants to reconcile us to himself. And he made that possible by sending Jesus, who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life through faith in him. And you can receive that new life when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God who died and rose again. When you repent, turning away from your old sinful life and turning back to God for new life. When you confess that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and when you join with Jesus in your own spiritual death, burial, and resurrection by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And when you do that, you'll be saved. 
God will forgive you and God the Holy Spirit will come and live within you, helping you to live this new life along with your new family, the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, working together to stand on the gospel and share the gospel with people around us who desperately need to hear it and respond to it so that they might find new life in Jesus. So if you're ready to make that decision, or if you've got any questions about anything that I've said, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ uh, so that we might get together and work through all of that as soon as possible. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, I praise you for the, the good news of the gospel, that because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, we don't have to stay lost in our sins. And so, Father, I pray for the church that we would stand firm on the gospel, that we would not be distracted uh, or distract anyone with even good deeds so that we might tell others the good news of forgiveness of sin and new life through Jesus. I pray for those who have not yet put their faith in Jesus. God, lead them to yourself by your Holy Spirit and through your word and with the help of your people, the church so that they might be reconciled to you through faith in Jesus. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.